Surprisingly, what I'm going to talk about, actually two research we have conducted with my colleagues and uh, completed recently, is very much connected to, to Jacobs and the Danish team's uh, contribution today to, uh, for today about democratization of culture, cultural democracy, and copyright policies supporting or, or not exactly supporting these kind of approaches um, and the praxis of, um, of cultural heritage institutions. So the two projects, the two research initiatives we've been doing over the last one and a half years was first looking at the historicity and policy trajectory of European Union copyright legislation, especially the so-called cultural exceptions and limitations in European Union copyright law, the educational and research exceptions, with special regards to availability and accessibility of archives. The outcome of this research was, of course, an academic paper published, published by a journal. The other one we have just finished last week will be uh, published soon by the, um, <coughs> it was a research grant of the International Federation of Audiovisual Archives, the Fiat IFTA, looking at four, four specific countries and the praxis of making available the collection of audiovisual broadcast archives in those countries and the impact of digitization. The, uh, the output of this project is a report um, research report, um, soon hopefully made available by Fiat IFTA. Both cases, in my view, in our view, are also to showcase how copyright over the course of the years became a symbol of barrier to access in accessing cultural and historical content by citizens even in the European Union. For both research, um, <coughs> we have used the cases, I would say, of digital broadcast archives. Why we did that? Because these archives are one of the key facilitators of content creation and distribution. Our aim was looking at the archives because they exemplify precisely the connection between creation of content and distribution in ways which are radically different to when these archives were created, if you look at them historically. Also, creation and distribution of content creates archives for the future. So in both cases, we have chosen um, not just audiovisual archive, but audiovisual broadcast archives. So archives that are consisting of content for broadcasting purposes for television and radio broadcasting. Our focus was on copyright exceptions and limitations, and actually copyright implications on the use of content by the public from three different perspectives. Copyright law that was some time ago an often overlooked footnote now occupies a central position in debates surrounding the relationship between freedom of expression, language and ownership. Copyright frameworks have great impact to the availability of culture, the accessibility of cultural content, and the dissemination of cultural goods. Therefore, the setting of copyright rules bears with critical significance to claim and policy of cultural democracy, and if you want to put it that way, democratization of culture in Europe.
If you consider European Union copyright legislation, it is the so-called Information Society Directive. We have heard about this at the presentation made by Mozilla um, in the first session. And the Information uh, Society Directive dated back to 2001. It is Article 5 of the Directive that mostly and the best represents the politics of EU copyright legislation as a reflection of the public interest at large. Article 5 refers to exceptions and limitations to reproduction rights and to the rights to communicate to the public intending to promote cultural purposes. Exceptions and limitations, I think most of you are familiar with these concepts, but these are the, the cases when national legislations can freely adapt rules to make products available without rights clearance. So these are the cases when public interests override the interest of the copyright holder and were set by the directive to, uh, to be offered to the member states to be implemented. The exceptions and limitations as incorporated and formulated in Article 5 are categorized into two sets of legal provisions. The first set, which had a greater impact, it's a quote from the European Commission, which had a greater impact on the internal market, has been made obligatory. Except actually, it was one single provision that was obligatory, which was in favor of the industry, actually the ISPs, to make the internet flow, as we have heard today. These, um, these exceptions, so to the adoption of these exemptions into national law, it was mandatory to the member states. Meanwhile, the exceptions that were relevant to cultural policies have been adopted as optional exceptions, and member states were free to choose, quote again from the European Commission, free to choose to keep or introduce these, extra, these exceptions at the national level. The optional rules, also referred by some academics as the shopping list, aim to capture all possible solutions and, and uh, situations and conditions under which content should be exempted from copyright restrictions without clear guidance on their enforcement or supporting actions for the cultural heritage institutions who should have benefited from them. As a result, after 16 years, the uh, 16 years have gone by since this legislation was adopted. So within these 16 years, cultural heritage institutions were simply struggling with fulfilling their roles in the 21st century in that sense. And we were pointing out that this struggle was mainly caused by a compromise and this compromise created an obstacle to build European identities through shared through shared memories and does not reflect the continuum of content creation and distribution. Vague policies, missed opportunities and contradictory initiatives are the main outcomes of Europe's copyright saga in respect to digital cultural heritage online. Exposing cultural heritage institutions to big right owners to determine the extent to which the dissemination of knowledge can take place exclusively through contractual, contractual arrangements, thus hindering them to fulfill their public service mission. We argue that European policies on the availability and accessibility of, cultural archive, of digital archives are of a nature of a compromise because of the contradictory claims of the citizens' needs and the economization of the cultural goods. And this compromise came at a very high price. Digitization of archives were funded by public subsidies and by public money and was not cheap. 
only the European Union over the course of these years, over the course of 16 years, have spent billions of European Union taxpayers' money to digit digitization. I think there are many of you in this room who have been, who have participated, participate, participated in several um, of the European Union's projects to digitization. Um, the early, in at the early 2000s, digital, um, uh, uh, the first digital initiatives, then the e-content, then the e-content plus, then EU screen and EU screen XXL, and recently the European Sounds project uh, in itself with about um, 600, 6 mil, uh, billion uh, euros funded. So what we can see that on the one hand, Europe was spending money and making efforts to digitize um, European cultural heritage. However, the same efforts we could not see make in supporting them, in making them available. Therefore, we argue that the European legislative framework has failed to deliver those solutions which were sought by EU policies of cultural democracy and fair, equal and accessible provisions of culture for all citizens. The legal uncertainty regarding the manner in which digitized material may be used and reproduced constitutes a disincentive to digitization and cross-border cooperation. The vagueness and optionality of the limitations and exceptions, the uncertainty of conviction and the inability to mit mitigate conflicting interests are clear signs of European cultural policy failures. And the fact that the European Commission itself was aware about the impact of this ambiguity as early as 1997, so years before the directive was actually adopted, makes this outcome even more worrisome. And now, just in okay, uh, just in uh, uh, um, maybe one minute. Another example with the same cases about how this um, inambiguity or, or failure, if you want to put it, how this affects other fundamental European Union policies. First and foremost, policies in regards to media pluralism and public service media in Europe. That ha is to claim to serve universality, pluralism, independence, accountability, innovation and excellence. So the second effort we, we were uh, <coughs> struggling with recently to take forward the, the, the findings of our previous research was focusing on four countries, Poland, Austria, Hungary and Greece, and in total six archi archives, broadcast, uh, audiovisual broadcast archives in these countries. We were looking at several factors, but here first and foremost the legal conditions, the statutory rules, the preservation of audiovisual materials, copyright fair use regulations, whether they were in place or not, and the licensing regimes um, in these, uh, and the impact of these rules to, to, the, to the praxis and the, the reality of these archives. We have found some nice initiatives, I would say, but the big picture about the struggles of these archives, and here, um, this is a very big difference to, to the, um, to the um, reality of the National Museum in Denmark where you were able to clear rights with 450 right holders. It's a whole different ballgame if it comes to audiovisual works where you have dozens of right holders, unidentifiable, un non-traceable, so it's a whole different uh, uh, issue to, 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 to get permissions for them, for the use. 
basically it was out of question. So all archives were only ma able to make um, available their collections for those uh, uh, artifacts that they could um, license under the education and research um, exceptions and limitations. Also, all archivists claimed copyright being the biggest obstacle in the work, also in cases when this was not the case in legal terms. I think it's also a very interesting outcome about the perception of copyright among the community of, uh, of archives. Of course, we are aware of the, the proposed new rules and the European Union copyright reform process, but from the distance we are watching, from our academic distance we are watching this process, what we see is that the proposed rules are not aware of the reality of how and what open museums or the um, or the the uh, the possibilities and the aims of cultural heritage institutions about a digital future could be. So we were arguing that Europe needs to consider what kind of intervention Europe is standing for. What is European policy in terms of cultural democracy or democratization of culture, and whether it's the industry, whether it's the economization of cultural goods, or, <coughs> or the responsibility towards the citizens and the democratic values and principles that should drive also copyright legislation. Thank you so much. <laughs>